Hello, this is Arian Boss and you're about to listen to a radio play called Wu's Spiral. Before Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom came out, Clayton Fury posted his theories about Benjamin Lockwood and it was discussed if Lockwood was in fact Norman Atherton, the scientist mentioned in Crichton's book that had praised Henry Wu, which made Hammond pursue him for doing the miracle work of his ambitious park. When Fallen Kingdom came out, I was left with a lot of questions, as I'm sure many fans were. I started to piece together the history from what we knew and from other canon sources, like the books, and wrote the Hammond and Lockwood Fallout, which was released earlier this year on June 16 on the podcast to answer the question how Lockwood fit the picture with Hammond. With their history, I then still kept thinking about how Henry Wu ended up with Benjamin Lockwood. In my mind, this couldn't be the deal he'd been working on with Vic Hoskins. Too much of a coincidence that Wu would be working indirectly for Lockwood with him knowing Benjamin, specifically if he was the one behind cloning Macy. That is of course still not considered canon, but it's still a possibility. Shortly after the movie, at Jurassic Nublar posted his theory on Twitter about earthquakes on the island and how that could have caused the damages we see during the early shots in the movie. The earthquakes got stuck in my mind, with Masrani trying to get preparations done to bring the park back in order. With the monorail train crashing where we saw it during one earthquake while doing a test run. Because with the evacuation we can assume the monorail train made it back safely to its main station. Many questions were left and in December last year I decided to write out Wu's story as it had taken shape in my mind, as much canon incorporated as possible with touches of my imagination. This radio play is the result of that script. Some tweets sent out by those involved explaining time periods seen on screen have been ignored consciously to better fit what's seen on screen and most of what you'll hear is completely fan fiction with some canon facts. I hope you enjoy it. This Jurassic tale starts in the first week of 2015, at the evacuation of Jurassic World. This ended the park's operational days, but started a whole new chapter in the life of Dr. Henry Wu. Wu got on the helicopter, taking the most important DNA samples with him, which he needed for the job he worked on for Vic Hoskins' asset containment unit, or ACU. Where is Hoskins? He's sending you and the assets to a secure location. But our deal is still intact! Don't worry, you'll be well taken care of. Let's go! Uncertain where Hoskins was, the promise his men would take care of him made him feel a little better in Hoskins' absence, and he left the island behind. Yet, none of them had foreseen the turn of events that would follow. By March 2015, a class action lawsuit against Masrani Global was in full swing, and bit by bit, lawyers and judges pieced together the events that had led to the hundreds of injuries and a few dozen deaths of park guests and workers. Most injuries the result of panic, visitors trampling each other. Pteranodons that caused the panic had another large number of injuries and some of the deaths written to them. Among the dead, Masrani Global's former CEO, Simon Masrani, who died in a helicopter crash after escaping Pteranodons attacked it. It didn't take too long before most of the dead park workers, members of the park's ACU, had to be addressed and the Indominus Rex was finally mentioned. An animal unknown by paleontology. Unknown in fact to the entire world, but for its name mentioned in early commercials Masrani Global had released. They had announced the animal's arrival for the park's 10th anniversary celebrations, planned for June and now obviously cancelled. The animal's unusual features like camouflage and masking its thermal signature came up in the explanation of how the animal came to escape and this... Who would have known the attention would now point to Dr. Henry Wu? Certainly not Henry himself. With the spotlights on him, an uneasy feeling had crept upon him at his testimony. With the Indominus Rex dead and gone, Masrani Global's representative Richard Wiesner had ensured the public incidents like this would not happen again and the company was allowed to return to Isla Nublar, contain the situation and get the park back up and running, hopefully allowing the park and Masrani's Indian branch to survive the fines they would almost certainly have to pay for the incident. But Indian didn't need Henry Wu anymore and in the wake of the incident, they had thrown him under the bus, as the fall guy. The judge is now taking his part in the incident under the loop. Henry had not expected it would go this far. How could the law see him responsible? Simon himself had placed the order for the animal, 
ACU's miscalculation escalated the incident to an unnecessary level. Certainly Vic Hoskins and Simon Masroni had equal, if not more, responsibility for the events that had occurred. But both Simon and Vic were among those who died. And so Henry found himself driving through the gates of an estate in Northern California, parking his car in front of an enormous house, almost a castle. He looked up, then walked up the stairs to the large wooden doors decorated with iron ornaments, lion head knockers and a large capital L in the center. He rang the doorbell and waited for someone to answer. Finally an elderly woman opened the door and a frown of surprised recognition appeared on her face. Hello Iris. Dr. Wu, this is a surprise? Iris said. It's been a long time since we've seen you around here. How have you been, Henry? In good health, but my career has seen better days. Having seen the news, Iris was aware of the developments on the Jurassic World incident lawsuit. Her face turned serious again, sympathetic. Yes, so I've heard. Are you here to see Sir Benjamin? You didn't have an appointment with him, did you? No, 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 I did not. But I'm hoping he wouldn't turn away an old friend. I'm certain he would not. Mills cut in, walking up the stairs behind Wu and past Henry and Iris to stand next to Iris as he introduced himself. Dr. Wu, what an honor to receive you here at Lockwood Manor. I'm Eli Mills. I'm, say, Mr. Lockwood's financial advisor. Let's keep it simple, eh? He smiled and gave Wu a hand. Then, looking at Iris, he continued. I'm sure Mr. Lockwood would receive you. Yes, that may well be, Mr. Mills. But Sir Benjamin is currently out with his granddaughter. Oh, I can keep Dr. Wu entertained for a while. But that's not your responsibility. Eli Mills smiled again at Wu. Iris, I've taken care of the Lockwood fortune for five years now. Certainly I can keep one of his guests entertained for a few hours. And bypassing Iris, he signaled Henry Wu to come in. If you'd follow me, we can wait for Mr. Lockwood to return in the library. Certainly. Come in, Henry. I'll send up Sir Benjamin when he comes in. Thank you both. As Eli Mills led the way, Wu followed him through Lockwood's private museum of dinosaur statues, bone displays and dioramas. Not much had changed here in all those years. A few updated displays, but Wu still remembered this. Eli looked back at Wu and said, So how do you know Mr. Lockwood? Oh, we go way back. The when John Hammond hired me in 1982, when he and Lockwood were still pushing needles into amber in their basement lab here. I was a young graduate student working on my my doctorate in the labs of one of the most renowned scientists in the country at the time, Norman Atherton. Isn't that the scientist that died? That very same year, in fact, leaving the laboratory in chaos. Two weeks after the funeral, Hammond came to see me. Henry told Mills about this piece of history, and his mind trailed back to 1982. Norman always said you were the best geneticist in his labs. What are your plans now? Finish my doctorate? Then, I don't know. Research? You want a university appointment? Yes. That's a mistake. At least, if you respect your talent. Why? Let's face facts. Universities are no longer the intellectual centers of the country. Since World War II, all the really important discoveries have come out of private laboratories. <laughs> I'm not saying anything you don't know. The laser, the transistor, the polio vaccine, the microchip, the hologram, the personal computer, magnetic resonance imaging, CAT scans, the list goes on and on. Universities simply aren't where it's happening anymore. If you want to do something important in computers or genetics, you don't go to a university. Good heavens, all you must go through to start a project. How many grant applications, how many forms, how many approvals? The steering committee, the department chairman, the university resources committee. How do you get more workspace if you need it? More assistance if you, if you need them? How long does all that take? A brilliant man can't squander precious time with forms and committees. Life is too short. DNA, too long. If you want to get something done, stay out of universities. I'm talking about work, real accomplishments. 
What does a scientist need to work? He needs time. He needs money. I'm talking about giving you a five year commitment and a ten million dollars a year in funding. Fifty million dollars. And no one tells you how to spend it. You decide. Everyone just gets out of your way. In return for what? For taking a crack at the impossible. For trying something that probably can't be done. What does it involve? I, I can't give you the details, but the general idea involves cloning reptiles. I don't think that's impossible. Reptiles are easier than mammals. Cloning probably 10, 15 years off. Assuming some fundamental advances. I've got five years, and a lot of money for someone who wants to take a crack at it now. Is my work publishable? Eventually. Not immediately? No. But eventually publishable. <laughs> Don't worry. If you succeed, the whole world will know about what you've done. I promise you. In the meantime, they had walked up metallic stairs and arrived in a comfortable sitting area among scientific books. Eli suggested a chair. Thank you. And Henry sat down, while he continued telling Mills about his adventure. Then John brought me here and introduced me to Mr. Lockwood. Anything to drink? We've got an open bar here. Mills smiled again and walked to the bar, while he poured Wu a glass of amber-colored whiskey. When he handed it to Wu, he brought the conversation going again. So then Mr. Hammond brought you here to meet Mr. Lockwood. What happened then? When they told me what they wanted me to do, at first I thought they were mad. Then they showed me they had already retrieved fragments of dinosaur DNA and an old mosquito encased in amber. Clearly, they weren't mad. It was brilliant. But if they wanted to succeed in five years, we had to go big. Hammond and Lockwood had to expand mining operations mm -hmm. and search specifically in places that they were likely to find amber. Old enough to contain mosquitoes that fed on dinosaurs' blood not just the accidental mosquito found in a coal or amber mine anywhere around the world. Most of those were good enough to test extraction methods on, but not old enough to contain dinosaur DNA, so they started buying relevant amber mines and opening a few new ones. Lockwood told me that the woman in their San Diego office helping them analyzing the extracted DNA was too much of a perfectionist and stubborn in her ways. I'm willing to look for out-of-the-box solutions to faster results. Using her methods, wanting to find as, as much, if not all, the original pieces of the puzzle from Amber. They'd still be gathering DNA from mosquitoes today. That's what they wanted me to do. Come with those solutions. Her team was perfect to extract and analyze DNA from the incoming mosquitoes so I could concentrate on my work, on how to go from DNA fragments to an embryo. Luckily, the amber mines proved very effective. Quality samples came in on a regular basis, and as extraction methods improved, we could retrieve better DNA fragments. Soon, we had an impressive library of samples of unknown species. I just needed to complete the code somehow. Of course, the work had immediately shifted once I discovered that DNA retrieved was more avian than reptilian much more complex. How much I wanted to reveal my findings when paleontologists began suggesting the same, based on the research of bones. But I had to remain silent. How did you pick what dinosaur to clone first? There was no way to know what kind of dinosaur DNA I was working with until I was able to clone one from it. But then again, in case I did succeed, they had no idea how to take care of a baby dinosaur. Right. So I got them together a team of renowned paleontologists and zoologists to provide us with as much needed information on how best to raise a dinosaur or an animal without its mother. All without giving away what we were actually doing. Who could have guessed, right? So how did you ask them? They built an amphitheater in San Diego, which they thought could later serve as a park. But at the time, they stuffed it with displays of dinosaurs' nesting sites and showed it to the paleontologists, as if that park was what we were providing the information for. From Sorner, 
where I had convinced them to move the facility to using some of the fastest computers available to analyze and sample the DNA. I started to piece together the puzzle by looking for possible matches between the dino DNA, that of contemporary species, amphibian, reptilian, birds, etc., which I stored in our library. It was my idea to use that to fill in the gaps, and quickly I could start cloning in just two years since I started. I had my first success, a Parasaurolophus hatched. Wasn't a Triceratops first? Even though it only lived for a few weeks or days, I had the first DNA fragments identified and created a life from DNA that was trapped inside a tiny body of a mosquito, stuck in tree sap for millions of years. How incredible. Right. The next year I identified six other species from growing embryos. Soon we had so many embryos growing at our factory that San Diego Park was just too small to set up for what we were able to accomplish. Isla Nublar was leased later that year. Sadly, none of the embryos survived incubation that year, frustrating Hammond and Lockwood. It took me almost two years since the first for the next dinosaur to hatch. I had focused my efforts to create that Triceratops, and it paid off. This was put down as our first official success when it had survived for a month, and several other successes had followed. My efforts really started snowballing then. Six years after I started, I identified 14 different species from 17 DNA fragments, which I had been able to complete successfully. They started building the paddocks on Nublar and moved a few dinosaurs into the park. And that year, the 21st dinosaur hatched, 25th counting the ones that died, including the first Triceratops, which died within its first year. But when I started to concentrate my efforts on this animal, I knew this was going to be our main attraction. It was a baby Tyrannosaurus Rex had hatched. It was then that John promoted me to chief geneticist, and he rewarded me by having everyone address me as a doctor. Weren't you a doctor before? Didn't you get your PhD? I heard the judges threaten to strip you of your titles. Oh, I, I did get my PhD after I finished my doctorate from 95 to 97 when Atherton died. My doctorate wasn't complete because John had convinced me that the university would be wasting my time. Early on, on Sonar, I had succeeded to change a seed to grow into a plant from ancient DNA we extracted from a leaf in amber, too. It was a fun experiment and proved quite easy. That had inspired me to write a book in 95 and continued my doctorate working with plants without revealing what we'd been doing on the islands. Since at the time, that all still had to be kept a secret. So you had lied all that time to InGen? No, I never lied. When Hammond promoted me after the T-Rex was born, he agreed my accomplishments certainly proved me PhD worthy. And since my work could not be public yet, he told me everyone to address me as Dr. Henry Wu. Which most of them already did, anyway. Everyone just got used to it, and, and it stuck. It never occurred to me to readdress this issue until my time freed up in, in August 1994. Time was flying by while Henry Wu recounted the years since he started work for InGen. And in the meantime, Benjamin Lockwood arrived home with Maisie. He ran up the stairs of the house, and Maisie giggled as Lockwood chased her up the, to the doors. When they entered the great hall, Lockwood saw Iris coming up to them. Sir Benjamin, Dr. Henry Wu is waiting for you with Mr. Mills in the library. Surprised and slightly shocked at hearing Henry Wu being in his house, he quickly tried to correct himself to hide his concerns from Maisie. Thank you, Iris. I'll go out to him immediately. We had fun, didn't we? Yes, thank you, Grandpa. You're welcome, my heart. Now run along. Go have one of your adventures. Okay, Grandpa. Bye, Iris. Not too long, little one. It's time for bed soon. Oh, let her have a little more fun, Iris. She'll be alright. So what's Dr. Wu doing here? I don't know, sir, but Mr. Mills was good enough to keep him entertained in the library. They'll be waiting for you there. Thank you, Iris. Curious but concerned, Benjamin Lockwood made his way through the display room and up the metallic stairs where he overheard the last thing Eli said to Dr. Wu. Incredible how that all went down. If you ask me, it should have been Lockwood buying in Jen, not Masrani back then. 
John knew I wasn't the right person to take over. Both Henry Wu and Eli Mills stood up from their chairs. Mr. Lockwood. My mind was focused on other things at the time. Things go down the way they do for a reason. Eli, thank you. No problem, sir. Really. Would you please leave us? Of course. Dr. Wu? Eli Mills bowed a little towards Henry to bid his goodbye and left to go down the stairs. But before he reached the stairs, Henry broke the silence hanging between him and Benjamin Lockwood. It's good to see you, sir. How is your, your daughter? My granddaughter, Maisie. She's doing fine, healthy. That's good to hear. I saw her picture. She really does look exactly like her. Yes, she does. Something in this conversation had triggered curiosity in Mills, and he stayed just at the bottom of the stairs, listening in on the conversation. But I hope it's not Maisie, nor her health which brought you here, is it? No, sir, it's not. I'm sure if anything was the matter, you'd know it by now. What's all this? That's good to hear. You scared me a little there. Don't you go get any ideas, Henry. Sir? Look, Henry, I know about you and my daughter. I know what she meant to you. This confused Henry even more. I'm not sure what you mean, sir. You knew? Of course I knew. I was her father. She may have lived with her mother, but did you really think I wouldn't have known she visited more often? Why did you think we sent you off to Sauna for your research? I don't want you to get any ideas about Maisie. She's not your second chance. This sank in quickly with Wu. Shocked Lockwood would think this. No, sir, of course not. That never occurred to me. I know the difference between your 18-year-old daughter then and a 6-year-old girl now. And I'm not the 24-year-old guy I was either. I can assure you she has nothing to do with my being here. I found peace with the fact that she found another man to make her happy long ago. I'm just surprised to learn that you knew about us. Young people often think they can hide their love from the world, but they seldom do, Henry. The way you two looked at each other, it was obvious. It's not that I didn't think you weren't good enough for her, just, you know, we needed you to focus on the work and she was still so young. Anyway, I'm glad to hear it's not that. So, what did bring you here? To be honest, sir, I could think of no other place to go. It looks like they're going to sentence me. What can I do to help, Henry? If it's alright with you, sir, I'd like to stay here for a little while until this wave of negative attention has passed. People don't understand. As Ronnie tries to blame me for the whole thing of what happened at the park. The company, not Simon. I'm sure if Simon was alive, I wouldn't be in this mess. Or Hoskins. What do you mean? Why would they blame you? You've probably heard of the new dinosaur they were promoting in the preparation of the 10th anniversary of the park. The... Indo-something, correct? That one, yes. Someone came forward explaining it was that animal's escape and it broke it into the aviary that set loose all the pteranodons which caused the injuries in the park. Including some deaths, I heard. That may be, but surely that's not my fault. Simon himself ordered the animal I created. Now they're saying I created a monster that could not be contained, with features that make no sense on zoo animal. Something coincidental, which the ACU wasn't prepared for. But ACU isn't my responsibility either. That was Hoskins. And with Hoskins and Simon both now gone, they aim their arrows at me. It's all just really unfair. On top of that, with the spotlights on me, Hoskins' guys stepped back on the deal I had with them. Deal? Hoskins had this idea to design animals for military application. My success with the raptors and designing the Indominus Rex had him approach me about this idea back in 2013. Preparations were well underway, and we were supposed to start just after the 10-year anniversary celebrations had started. When the park fell, we evacuated the lab and they told me I could shift my attention to this new project immediately. But when Mezrani pushed me under the bus, the people I worked with didn't want the attention drawn to them, and they literally threw me out on the street. This is all really unfortunate, Henry, but I don't see how I could help. I can give you money, arrange a hotel for you in San Francisco to attend the trials and wait out the verdict, but I can't let you stay here in hiding and risk being charged for aiding and abetting a fugitive when it comes to it. I'm really sorry, Henry. But I thought, because of our history, and Maisie... Maisie needs me. I just can't risk it, Henry. Down the stairs, Iris approached, seeing Eli at the bottom of the stairs. Mr. Mills? 
What are you doing here? Iris, ah, I uh, was just about to ask Mr. Lockwood's approval on a pressing financial issue that needs his attention right away. Surely you should have let me know Sir Benjamin was in here alone with his guest. I could have offered them tea, but there's a phone call for him now. I will tell him. Thank you. Iris waited for a moment, thinking. Thank you, Iris. All right. He can take it in his office. Sure. Then Eli Mills cautiously walked up the stairs, looked back to see Iris walking away and cleared his throat to announce his entrance. Ahem. <clears throat> Mr. Lockwood, so sorry to bother you, but there's a phone call for you which you can take in your office. Thank you, Eli. I'll take it right away. Please can you give Dr. Wu here another drink. Help him find a place to stay in San Francisco on my expense and please show him out after. I'm very sorry, Henry. If the situation was different, I would definitely help you. But as it stands now, I don't see another way. I'm not as fit as I once was and tired of the day. I would like to rest after that call, so I'll say my goodbye. You need to be strong and face this like a man of honour. I know you can see it through, Henry. I wish you the best of luck. Sir, thank you. Disillusions. Wu stared after Benjamin Lockwood, leaving the room. What can I offer you, Dr. Wu? No, nothing. I should go. I'm sorry Mr. Lockwood didn't live up to your expectations, but maybe there's another way I can help instead of finding a hotel. There is. I couldn't help but overhear you mention a military application you weren't supposed to be working on. Oh, don't worry, I wasn't eavesdropping. I was about to enter the room when you mentioned it, and Iris interrupted me downstairs. Do you still have the means to see that deal through? I might know an interested party. I still have the DNA samples I was planning to use, but no equipment, no place to work. If I could provide you with what you need, could you provide me with the animals? I'd love nothing more to continue my work, but... But what? You had a deal with another party about it? Didn't they break that when they threw you out on the street? Yes. Then you are free of any obligations to them. You said you'd love to continue your work. Let me show you where you can stay. What about Mr. Lockwood? It's better if he doesn't know. Plausible deniability. This will be our secret. Follow me. I'll show you. As Wu followed Mills, another subject came to Eli's mind. Something that sparked his interest. And as they continued walking, Eli asked. You knew his daughter. In love, I hear? Yes. She was the most beautiful girl I ever saw. So what happened there? When I started work here, in the basement laboratory, one day in my first week, she just walked in, and we started talking. We dated for a few months until Hammond finished the research facility on Sonar. And they moved me off to continue my work there. We were very much in love, and it broke my heart when I left and I had to tell her. We had to wait five years for me to fulfill my contract with Hammond and Lockwood. Still, she didn't want her father to know, so we couldn't write each other. We knew that Mr. Lockwood would find out if I was sending her mail, and he would certainly recognize her handwriting if she would send me one. I didn't see her again for four years. But by then, she had fallen in love with someone else. For me, the time had passed fast because of my work. I guess it, it took her too long. She was 18 when we met. Mills was confused, but knew better than to interrupt a good story. It didn't make too much sense to him. How could she have been 18 at the time? She died young, he knew. But her daughter, Macy, was only six years old now, born a year before Mills was employed right out of college. So how? He waited while Henry continued. I believe Isabel met him around the time her mother died. Mr. Lockwood was away a lot in San Diego, and with me in Sorna. He took her once to show her the facility, and the young trike when I had succeeded in my work. She didn't see me then, but that was the first I saw of her as she passed the window of my office. She married the other guy a year after that, and of course, I could never be there for her. I mean, I couldn't even attend her wedding. Mills decided to ask. The math just didn't match his understanding. She died too young. Way too young, yes. Just 28. When was this again? I believe it was back in 92. But Maisie is only six. This question shocked Wu, not knowing how to respond. While they got in the elevator, Wu became a little nervous. I don't get it. How? Wait. No. Really? No, to whatever you're thinking. He made her again, didn't he? Maisie is Lockwood's daughter's clone. No, I don't know. I see it in your face, Doctor. Why would you deny it? How else could you explain it? I mean, you asked after Maisie. Wait, 
You mentioned her name as in your history together. Oh my! You cloned her, didn't you? You did! This is good. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said all those things. Anyway, here we are. The sub-basement facility where it all started. Still here and Lockwood never comes here anyway. Cages for when the animals hatch and everything. You'll be safe here, Doctor. And don't worry about your secret. That's safe with me too. The sub-basement laboratory. Lockwood Manor. Dusty, spider webs everywhere. But surely enough space and we wouldn't need the whole area immediately. He had a place to stay. That was what counted. And what more? He could get to work take his mind off his current situation and finally take on the, this next challenge, this new work of art he had almost given up on. In the next few days, Wu explained to Mills what he had done with the raptors, about his success with the Indominus Rex, and what kind of equipment he needed to finish the plan. To create a large type of raptor, strong as the Indominus, highly trainable and obedient like the raptors Wu had created for the Ibris project. Mills specifically asked for the ability to camouflage and hide its thermal signature too. Traits that had made no sense in a zoo animal, but all the more for an animal deployed in a battle zone. Henry Wu saw no reason why he couldn't build in these traits to Mills' satisfaction. And when Mills delivered on his promise of a gene sequencer, Henry Wu got to work a few days after he took his residence in Lockwood Manor. Wu was sure that when these animals would be sent into caves and jungles instead of American soldiers, it would save many lives. With his name connected to this animal, people would certainly soon forget about the failure of the park. Caused by the incompetence of park management to care for an animal they just didn't yet know. How could they blame him for what had happened? But they did, and in his absence, they stripped him of his credentials. Just like that, they ruined his career. Or did they? No, that didn't matter now. It would all blow over. In less than a year, the first two Indoraptors hatched in the spring of 2016. One white and one black. But from all Wu had promised, these creatures did not live up to Mills' expectations. Sure, they looked menacing, already as small as they were, especially the black one. And yes, they would grow. But they showed no signs of being able to camouflage, nor avoiding detection by the thermal cameras installed to check for that ability. On top of that, in the months that followed, both proved hard to handle too. Mills' animal trainer couldn't get them to follow any kind of order, stubborn as they were. Both seemed to respond aggressively to high-pitched sounds, and the black one liked to play catch with laser pointers. That was a lot of fun, but everything the trainer had been able to do with them seemed coincidental. The trainer told Mills he thought he could work with it, but it was working with the animal's interest, not training them to do the things they wanted them to do. All in all, far from the sales pitch Mills had practiced in his mind for these creatures. I should have expected this. It's my fault. I don't understand. I did use the exact DNA samples of cuttlefish and tree frog as I used in the Indominus Rex. Yeah, and you told John Hammond the animals would all be female and that they would die if the park vets didn't add lysine to their food. <laughs> the lysine thing isn't on me. I told Hammond that to keep the supply of lysine for the animal's diet and keep the growth rate up. He was starting to get cheap on me and wanted to cut the supply. Yet he already complained about the animals not growing fast enough even though I had them reach adult size in five years or less. He was afraid if competitors would get their hands on the work before he could finally show it to the world. It had been nearly eight years then since I started. I never thought he would work it out into an official contingency plan. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can still deliver on my promise. I just need the DNA of the Indominus Rex to see what I missed. Compel the strands. Do you see an Indominus walking around here? No, but Claire testified that it was taken out by the Mosasaurus. Its skeleton should be in the bottom of the lagoon. No way the Mosasaurus consumed its bones and all. A small piece of bone is enough to get its DNA. Right. So you want me to go to Nublar and send divers in to get that DNA sample? Depends on how badly you want it to camouflage and reduce its thermal signature. They said on the news that the last earthquake on Nublar was a big one, taking down the hotel and undoing most of the repairs Ms. Ronnie had been able to do so far. They gave up on repairs until researchers knew more on the status of the island. 
It should be empty now. You said it yourself. You could get me anything I need. My next batch will be flawless. Certainly, if you get me the Raptor too to raise the babies and teach it to follow orders from birth, should make them easier to handle than these prototypes. What about the Mosasaurus? I doubt Miss Rani had time to feed it while they were doing repairs, and it's certainly not getting anywhere now. In the few months it will take you to repair, I'm sure it will be at the bottom of the lagoon too. Sad, but true. That animal boosted our ticket sales like no other. When we introduced her to the park's two-year anniversary, again, when we were introducing the feeding show two years later, when it was three and a half meters long, and once more we started doing the feeding show with great whites. I always thought the park had opened with those. Always planned, but it took a while. In any case, it will be weakened now. You should be able to take it out easily. And the dinosaurs on the island were moved north behind the wall of the restricted area for Mizrani to pull off the repairs. Exactly. Who doubted if the fences and walls of the further restricted area had survived the earthquakes, which seemed unlikely, but that was Mills' concern to find out. In the time it took Mills to prepare for the mission to get Indominus Rex DNA sample, scientists on Nubra discovered at Mount Saibo, a volcano on the island had become increasingly active. In February 2017, all human activity on the island was cancelled. All scientists evacuated. Perfect for Mills' plans. Although Wu told him their digital map design had been based on some sloppy intel, with the lagoon located on the southeast near the coast, Instead of in the center of the island, this was of little concern to Mills, and he sent his men in. Not long after, the debate began about the animals now possibly facing an extinction level event, as the volcanic activity on the island further increased. Quickly, Eli Mills devised a plan to rescue the animals, and with the approval of Benjamin Lockwood, Mills set up a plan to extract as many of the animals as possible. Benjamin Lockwood, who himself had fallen ill months earlier, told Eli to secure a sanctuary for the dinosaurs to be safely brought to, and where they could live out their lives in peace, as John Hammond would have wanted. An idea Eli saw no trouble entertaining Lockwood with, while he had other goals in mind. While Wu created the second batch of Indoraptors, an incident between the two prototypes ended the life of the white one. The trainer had pointed the laser on it, and triggered that high-pitched sound they hated so much, at the same time. The animal's response had been most interesting. It had gone ballistic. A small success at the cost of one of the prototypes, which seriously lacked social skills anyway. Mills wasn't in the least sorry for the loss of one of the prototypes. As smart as the prototype proved to be, the remaining black one had broken the light bulbs in his cage, then faked being tranquilized after two darts, killed an engineer and almost escaped if it hadn't been for the quick action of one of the handlers firing off a third dart. Being stubborn as they were, they were untrainable, unreliable. Well, that didn't matter anymore. Mills had thought it all through, and had his mind already set on the second batch, or possibly the third, if they could get the raptor. The third batch would be created, perfected with the raptor's blood, raised by an indoraptor of the second batch, itself raised by the raptor. If only the hunt for the animal on Nublar would go as easy as they had thought. It took time to track it down, in which they had succeeded twice now, but both times it had killed the hunter that tracked it and disappeared again. Mills started to wonder what improvement that raptor would be if his hunters couldn't handle that one either. Or could it be that the raptor would be more maternal towards the indoraptors perhaps? So they pressed forward. It wasn't until time was running out that Mills decided he needed someone to lure that raptor out. Who could think of one? Their trainer in Jurassic World, the animal behaviorist Owen Grady. When they had tracked him, Mills gave him a call, but to his disappointment, Mr. Grady proved impossible to persuade into helping them out. They really needed to move fast, so that tracking system Wu had told them about sounded real interesting right about now. But who could give them access, and why would they? It couldn't be more perfect that the Senate voted down the motion to save the animals from Nublar in June 2018, the to dooming them to their extinction. The that was the exact right moment 
to contact the lead organizer of the Dinosaur Protection Group, whose handprint would grant access to the tracking system, and could she possibly still persuade Mr. Grady? If someone could get him on board, she would be the one. And so... Iris, give Miss Deering a call, will you? Invite her over. I believe we can help each other in achieving our goals. This had to be decided today. It was now or never. Spiral featured the voices of Jurassic Unicast, James Hawkins as both John Hammonds and Henry Wu, and Steve Hurl as Benjamin Lockwood. Jurassic Kids AJ Koch and his daughter Annabelle as Eli Mills and Maisie. Jurassic James, James Ronan as Hoskins' as man. Victoria's Cantina Victoria as Iris and myself as the narrator. Thank you for listening and until the next Jurassic Tale.